Hi Rob, thanks for joining us today. Um, really looking forward to you uh, coming up and playing for us in Worcester on Thursday. So yeah, I thought it'd be great to start, uh, just catch up with you and uh, learn a little bit more about you. Um, I believe you're from New York originally, but you're now living in Barcelona, right? Yeah, so I'm from, I'm from New York State. I, uh, I was born in Ossining, New York. And like most people who live near a big city, when I became an adult, I moved into the city. But before we start talking about me, I just want to tell the viewers and the people in the local area that, if, if I'm not mistaken, you're a fairly new uh, venture, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we started Music Spoken here a year uh, last year. So just, yeah, been going about six so months. I just want to tell the people out there what it takes to do what you're doing and how important it is, even though it's not like movie star, rock star type of stuff. It's really important for the community. It's really important for music. And yeah, that's all I that's all I can say. So I wanted to say thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. And I'm really, and I'm really looking forward to to coming up there and supporting and doing what we love to do. Yeah. So anyway, cool. Yes. Yeah. Austin, New York, famous for Sing Sing Prison. Yeah. So, and point? you're now in Barcelona, right? Yes. Well, I actually came here from Vienna. I lived 13 years in Vienna. Okay. I, I was married there. I'm, I'm divorced. I have two amazing, beautiful daughters, talented. And yeah. And how I went to Austria was um, back in the 90s, I guess, uh, late 90s. I had been to a party and an old girlfriend uh, had a friend who had this party for this couple we thought were a couple it was a guy who was 25 years old and a woman who was 53 Sonia and James and, and they were not a couple but they had a birthday like two days apart so they th th always do this wild birthday party that people catered and the catering crew in the catering crew was uh kind of an attractive woman that I went up to talk to in the kitchen and then there was this guy standing not too far away, who was part of the candy crew with his hands in his pockets, like he wanted to punch me. <laughs> and he's and he said, That's my wife. And I said, Oh, sorry, blah, 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 blah. But I by the end of the night, uh, I had learned that this guy was an Austrian guitar player. Okay. And uh, in fact, a lot of the catering crew were actors and musicians, it's part of SAG or um what's the other New York actors uh union. And um, this guy, Hannes, uh, we, we, had, we had exchanged phone numbers and tried to get each other to gigs for like two years. And we were never able to do that. And then one year, one day out of the blue, I get this call. I'm putting together a band and uh, I wanted you to, you know, come and see if it works out. And if it doesn't, no hard feelings. And I thought that was a cool attitude. And I ended up playing two years with this guy, recording a CD in New York. And we did a tour of that CD in Austria. It was supposed to be Austria, Germany, but we lost the German gigs. Okay. And, while I, and while I was in Austria, I made some contacts. And the following year, I went back to try to, I got seven gigs of a 13 gig tour for this trio. And then I ended up living, I tell this story. I'm sorry to make this a long answer, but you can't, make this, you can't make this stuff up. When I was in Austria, I wasn't intending to stay in Austria. I wanted to be there for just a couple of, well, for like three weeks. And um, I was going to go to London and go to the Edinburgh Fest. I had come to Austria in June of 2003. Right, okay. And uh, I, pay, I was going to go, like I said, to London and Edinburgh, but... At the time, I was like, you know, even though I'm a professional musician, I was also an investment broker. Wow. And I was and I was making I was financing my basically my musical life, you know, with this. But my income stream got, got, got interrupted. Okay. And I had to make a decision to stay in New York. I had a ticket flying from New York June and coming back in September. And I had this long itinerary planned, which I had to change. So I paid this guy to keep this apartment that I was renting for the entire summer. And, and I was walking around the neighborhood. I used to walk around after a, a big meal and smoke a cigar. And I look up on the, uh, uh, on the street 
and the name of the street was Castelligasi. I was wondering if I made the right decision to stay. And <laughs> Gasse is the word for street in yep. German. And it was my family name. And two years later, I met my now ex-wife. I have two beautiful children. And I, I, when I started to come to, New, to London, I did my, my first CD, what do you call, release party at Pizza Express, which are, where I'm playing oh, yeah, yeah. In, yeah, on the 5th. And um, that started me going every year, doing like a tour, like six days or more. And because I was married and had kids, I really didn't want to be away from the family. Yeah, sure. For probably like six days at a time. But over since 2009, I've come up with so many contacts. And that's also why, again, I mentioned you being new and what you do, because I've seen so many places die and so many places keep on going. And it's really important for the, how should I say, the infrastructure of the clubs, the community, the musicians, mm. and also just to get it out there for the people, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. all about the music yeah, yeah. in the end. So to make a long story longer, yeah, that's how I, <laughs> that's how I came to, I got divorced and I needed to be close enough to see my girls. I needed to be in warm weather because I'm from New York and right on the Atlantic, you know, less than an hour from the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, and I lived in Austria, which is a landlocked country, and I could never get used to it really. So I needed to stay in a place that I close enough to see my girls. Sure. And in the warm weather, and that's how I came to Barcelona from Vienna. Yeah. Splendid. Ah, what a journey. There you go. So how did you get into drumming then, Rob? Because your 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 parents, well, I, your father was part of my old. part of my promotion says, and some people say I shouldn't say this, but I am a third generation drummer. My father and my uncle were pros in the union in New York City. Okay. One of their brothers had a day job and, and on weekends would play like events. Hmm. And their, their father was a carpenter. My grandfather, who I never knew, was a, a carpenter by trade, but he also played drums. But this was at a time, if you know the evolution of the drum set, it's not what the modern drum set is today. My father played the beginning of the modern drum set. Okay. My grandfather played, you know, it was nothing like the modern drum set, but the rhythm is in the blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, no, that's cool. And you, you got quite a lot of uh, different influences in your music, so how you, picked the, how you picked up those along the way? Well, I don't know if it's, you know, uh, London is a multicultural city, but New York and America, you know, if you think, Okay, I grew up, you know, in the early 70s and late 60s, and yes, I'm that old. And uh, <laughs> but the point is that, like, my mom, we only had AM radio at the time, you know. Right. And yep. my father couldn't see to drive; he never drove a car his whole life. So my mother would always drive us around, and we'd be going to the beach or something, and she'd have the radio, and it was only like five or six stations, but it was like James Brown, Mozart, Jimi Hendrix, The Beatles. Dave Brubeck, <laughs> Miles Davis, you know. Wow. And then, and then when we, uh, when we went home, my father and my mother, you know, American culture at the time, they really pushed television. Like if I don't, if I'm correct, at the same time that I was this age, the BBC only had two or even three channels, and they were off by eight at night. Or yeah, something like yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. So, channels, like, yeah. So the opposite was we're sitting in front of this propaganda machine saying, you know, like <laughs> buy Doritos or Coca-Cola or whatever. But the point is that the music that was on the television shows and the movie themes was just so amazing, so contemporary. Lalo Schifrin, uh, Henry Mancini, you know, Quincy Jones, you know, mm. as far as scores go. We had Miles Davis, we had Jimi Hendrix, we had the Beatles and all of the British stuff. And, and you know, the progressive rock was is basically a, an English invention, you know, it, and, yeah. and it's iconic, you know. So how did I get that? I was not in a place that had any kind of music. Well, Jack, Jaco Pastore is called a musical prejudice. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a purist, and I really don't like purists in any genre. But when it comes to jazz purists, I kind of equate them with religious fundamentalists. You know? 
And that doesn't mean that I don't like jazz and I don't like it. My problem is I write a lot of music from the, I write all my music from the guitar and I, I, I didn't, I, I'm not good enough yet to really write proper jazz, really burning heads and harmony. You know, I'm, I'm working on that, but you know, I just grew up with, um, and, and I kept an open mind and an open ear. Yeah. And I, I, I was, I was introduced to African music. My father was a member of the union in New York City, but also the union in Westchester County, which is the first county north of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Right. Because there are other counties on Long Island and whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, my father and a pianist friend of his, Dottie Andrews, they sponsored an African diplomat to come and do a cultural exchange. And he bought three indigenous drums. Okay. One, one was the size of a round coffee table. It actually had four legs and a zebra skin. It was probably like <laughs> a third of a meter. I mean, it's wow. really big. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then there were two djembes. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my father's friend, Dottie's son, played drum set, but my brother, Blaze, was a bongo player. And oh, I was right. playing... Yep. And I was playing drums and I wanted to play the drums, but they said there's no drums left. And they were like 12 and I was only eight years old. So they gave me claves. Uh, but this, <laughs> was, this was during the Afro pop phase with Manu de Bango, Mama Kuma, Mama Sa, Mama Makusa. Uh, Mama yeah, 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 yeah. Mama, Mama Makusa. And, and, and after hearing that <clears throat> and trying to discover more of this African music, it just stepped into my blood and hasn't left. <laughs> Ah, and, and, and since then I've listened to a whole lot of music and having musician friends, friends from different cultures, musicians from different cultures, I've been fortunate enough to be exposed to a huge variety of music. And when it comes down to it, it's all just music. Mm. People ask me, are you a jazz drummer? I say no. And then I say, <laughs> ah, shit, I'm a jazz drummer when I'm playing jazz. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and if you want to play something else, I had a really interesting conversation with a great drummer over there named Pete Cater. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was so gracious. He came to one of my gigs in 2019. And I said, as far as a working drummer, if you want to be a working drummer, you have to be like the best character actor in the world. Okay. <clears throat> They'll believe you in any outside of your ethnic group, outside of your age group, possibly outside of your gender. Think of Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie or whatever, you know? <laughs> and so when you play that style, it has to be really authentic. And why I think I have an ear for the authentic is that I was exposed to it. Yeah. Oh? yeah. So I just was a sponge. And, and music is a, I have this expression, music is a big place. Okay, yeah. And it's all about sharing and just listening. And uh, these words become dirty, like jazz could be a dirty word, but fusion is definitely a dirty word. But but all of music is a fusion. Yeah. Because yeah, it is. Because it once, is. do you know? It's never what, pure. Do you, <laughs> do you know where like bluegrass came from? Bluegrass was like the Irish coming and mixing with maybe another culture in the Midwest. Okay. And and that's a fusion of two different styles of folk yeah. music, yeah. for example. You know? yeah. So, so I, can I say, I love music and I'm always listening and, and reaching. And uh, of course I like music played by musicians, not by, com and with real things. No, I, I do like programmed music, but it's not, you know. Yeah it's a hybrid it's a hyphenated music it's not music you know yeah so again another long answer but that's how yeah, I, no, that's all good that's, that's, all how good. I, that's how i got this huge um influence body yeah. of influence you know? yeah and that's all coming through in the uh in the albums that i've uh, i've listened to um so yeah tell us a bit about boom the boom project because that you that's been going for quite a while isn't it in different different configurations yeah well, actually stuff, i started it in 2007 right. and um Jaco Pastorius, Tony Williams, and John McLaughlin had a thing that was supposed to be the superstar band called Trio of Doom. Right. Yep. But Jaco was getting crazy at this point, <laughs> and he kind of his behavior sabotaged what could have been a, an iconic thing because I I think it was 
after Mahavishnu Orchestra. Yeah, it was like when Jaka yeah, was already yeah, yeah, famous. Yeah, yeah. You know, Tony Williams was already famous and Amma Goffin was riding off Mahavishnu. And this was like the next super jazz band, you know. So I had a uh, a trio with an, is an Israeli piano player in Vienna named Eli Mieri and a uh, Chilean bass player named Marcelo Ramos. Marcelito, if you're listening. And, and I, I, I wanted to form a power trio a band called Trio with a play on words, Trio of Boom. Right, okay. <clears throat> and then Boom became a quartet and I wanted to keep, I want to, I hope this doesn't sound like I'm an egomaniac or something, but from a business point of view, I wanted to make it like a brand, you know? Sure. Yeah. And yeah. Italian Americans, if you've ever watched The Sopranos, mm. it's it's bada boom in New Jersey. In New York, it's boom. It's like, hey, yeah, I went, I met this girl and boom, you know, whatever, you know, and right. you know what I mean? So this is where the boom came from, but it's also um, the electricity that goes through a room when a band plays. Mm. I've, used, I've used this analogy once. If you have two bands, you're in the club and you hear this and people talking and the next band comes on and they're not louder, yeah. but all of a sudden, there's no sound in the club, and electricity goes through the room. That, to me, that's boom. That's okay. boom. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And the the, uh, the album, your latest album, so that was uh, 2021, wasn't it? The uh, Party at yeah. World Plaza. So that's all your own uh, compositions. Actually, um, yeah, I'm, intrigued, I'm intrigued how a, how a drummer goes about sort of writing. You said mentioned before you kind of write on your guitar. How do well, you go I've about been... writing? Composition. Well, I, I I started playing the drums when I was eight, and I didn't take a proper lesson until I was 16, mm. even though my father showed me some stuff, but I didn't learn how to read or anything, really. And I picked up the guitar when I was 14, because my father, my father had a day job. When, when I was, before I was born, you know, my father was just a musician until he got married. He didn't get have a day job until he got married. Mm -hmm. And then he got a day job in a publishing house on Music Row called G. Shermer's, which is now, well, became Brantano's. I don't know what it's called now. But G. Shermer's was just a publishing house that evolved into a musical instrument and record store. Right. And my father um, used to uh, bring home my records and all of the sheet music. And one day, okay, my father's a drummer. One day I said, can you bring me home a guitar? What? And this and this is when, you know, like kids are posing, playing air guitar in front of the mirror and stuff, you know, and my father, uh, I, our bedrooms were upstairs. My parents' bedroom and living room were downstairs. And sometimes my father didn't want to come up the stairs, so he would just talk to me from downstairs. And I'll never forget, he said with this trepidation in his voice, well, what do you want to play, the guitar or the drums? Because he thought, I guess he thought the guitar <laughs> players. Well, he, I guess he just thought it. Guitar players were posers, you know. Okay. Especially the that era of when I was a kid, like late sixties, early seventies, you know. So, um, uh, he gave me the guitar, and I started learning stuff by ear, and then I started taking guitar lessons, and and then when I went to university, I studied orchestra, percussion, piano, and composition. Right. And I always wanted. To I actually wanted to score a film. That was my dream. And I got accepted to Berklee College of Music on an audition. I got accepted in a really short amount of time, thanks to my percussion teacher at the time, my orchestra percussion teacher. But I couldn't afford to go. But if I would have gone to Berkeley, my major would have been film scoring and my minor would have been performance. Okay. Or education, because a lot of times... You know, all the people I know, especially since the musical landscape has changed, if you're a professional musician, the majority of your money comes from teaching, you know, unless you're in the two mm. percent, you know, yeah. of any genre. And jazz is not like, you know, I heard, did you know who Gilad Atzman was? He was an Israeli saxophone player, was big in the London scene for about 10 or 15 years, but he left London. Well, but I when I said, he was really, he was really big, alto sax player. And he, I, the, I saw him at a gig and he was entertaining the audience and he said, I'm not the brightest guy. I got into jazz for the money. 
<laughs> is, is there yes. any sort of process that you go through when you're writing? Well, okay, so there you go. So where it comes from is, you know, there are, I read Michael Brecker's book like three times in the last two years, and I'll never forget reading that uh, Michael Brecker didn't write any music until he was in his 30s, and he had been an established, like, star mm. from his 20s yeah. as a sideman and in the Brecker Brothers, but he didn't write. Yeah. Randy did all the writing. So there's what's called through writing, which means you finish the tune. You sit down and you're finished. And then mm -hmm. there's the process, which is you noodle and you do a little thing and then you say, okay, this part works, that doesn't, and you come back. And then there's the Joe Zavinul and other musicians where they improvise over either a vamp that they pre-record that they dub, overdub. Mm, yeah. So it could be overdub drums, it could be overdub chord progression, it could be overdub guitar vamp. And then they just start playing and they listen to it back and they say, I like this four bar. And then they, they construct it that way. Yeah. So, so I'm taking it, like I was having a conversation with my keyboard player because one of my misfortunes in life and my musical life is that I wasn't able to study piano properly. Because if I did, because we couldn't afford to have a piano when I was a kid, this a Casio, the first electric Casio had come on the market and it was $600 in 1970 something. So what is that? Like 2000. Mm. We, mm. that was just not possible. And my, my father was a blind, almost blind musician. And my mother was a housewife. So we were, and, not... and you wanted to play guitar as well. So it was already, <laughs> we were already clocking how many, how much yeah. gear you're going to be wanting to buy for that. Yeah. No, so, so, <clears throat> and, and listening to the television themes and, and all that stuff, I always approach the music as from as a whole. I don't approach it from the instrument, but when you compose, it can be a melody that you then have to harmonize and put a rhythm to. It could start with just the rhythm and then the chord progressions or bass line comes. It really comes from different places. And sometimes the whole thing just falls in your lap. Yeah. I have a I have a tune. It's really there's really not much to it. It's called Temporary Insanity on my first CD. Mm -hmm. Where I did that all one day in my ex-wife's living room before we were married on an acoustic guitar oddly enough because it's a really electric tune but the whole thing just fell into place i was like wow what if i do this here and do that there and then it sounded good and i'm like you you have to the thing about composition is like you can't be a perfectionist you have to learn when to say like it's enough yeah okay or, yeah <clears throat> or you have to give it to other people to hear mm. and see what their response yeah. is yeah yeah, yeah. It, you know so I'm still struggling with composition, but I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the uh, yeah, the, the two albums that I've heard uh, are, uh, are really cool, and uh, like I said, it's a good, really interesting mix of uh, of styles and stuff in there. Um, could you to, could you tell us a little bit about the band that you're bringing up on Thursday? Yeah, well, with you? <clears throat> as I, you know, unfortunately, being an international musician who is not funded by a label. I can't travel with the people that I record with. So yeah. in London, I've been playing with some of these guys, like Francesco, I've been playing mm. with man, It's close to 10 years. It's not yeah, 10 yeah. years, but it's close to 10 years. And Francesco, because I'm a guitar player, I'm very particular about guitar players in the band. I, and I'm very particular about anyone in the band with the sense of rhythm. Mm, yeah, I don't feel like as a drummer, I should have to be a metronome for you to have your shit together. Excuse my language. <laughs> no, I, <was> <laughs> I, I, I really don't have patience for that because I all, you know, I put the other thing is because I write the music from the guitar and it's heavy in the right hand and I'm good with rhythm. Sometimes the guitar players might be really great players in another way, but that if, if it's not just the rhythm, it's the endurance of doing that rhythm for a long period of time is challenging. Maybe not, maybe that's too generous. I'm making myself sound like it's, but the, for whatever reason, people have problems with the stuff. So when, when, I, when I find a guitar player that I like, I call them all the time. And that's why I call Francesco LaCastro. He is really amazing guitar player. And because he's Italian, he really comes from the melody. Right. Italian <laughs> Neapolitans, it's all melody. Okay. But but as a guitar player and as a professor of guitar, he studied 
all of the greats, Schofield, all the people before that. So he's got the he's got the funk thing down. He's got the phrasing thing down. He's got the electric thing down. He's got the clean thing down. And once you play with a person, you develop a kind of intuition. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I can remember playing a gig not very long ago with Francesco, where somebody in the audience said, man, that was so incredible. How long you guys been playing together? So I said, so how long, you know, and we did not rehearse for that gig. Right. We did, we did a sound check rehearsal and the place was like, they were on the floor, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's, it's not, it's honestly not from any one musician. That's the other thing I have to say, the band, any good band is greater than the sum of its parts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So Johnny Wickham, who plays bass, last I, I had met Johnny last year because um, there's a bass player in London named uh, Neville Malcolm, who's been on the scene for a long time and uh, with Caribbean roots. But he plays acoustic and electric, and he just plays such a wide spectrum of music. Anyway, he was supposed to do nine gigs with me last year, and he had some health issues and had to back out. So I needed a I needed a bass player, and Sam Leek, this young kind of prodigious guy who's doing really well, a really big name in London. He does shows at Ronnie Scott's and stuff, but he's an amazing player and a really really nice guy. And no, you kind of he's not high maintenance. You know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like relationships or whatever to yeah. be high maintenance. You know, he's not high maintenance at all, and he's really young. And sometimes the young guys are really a little. You know, they're not so open-minded as, as much as they're really good. Sam's not like that. So I said, I need a bass player. And Sam said, oh, there's this guy, Johnny Wickham. I play with him all the time, you know? And um, I'll never forget, I called Johnny. And I said, well, you know, if things don't work out. And I see, and he said, well, why wouldn't things work out? And I said, because I played with a lot of, I've been in a lot of situations with bass players and other musicians. I send them the music two months in advance. I send them the charts. They have all the time in the world. We do one rehearsal or two rehearsals and they don't play the shit right. Yeah. And, and other people like Davide Mantovani, Davide Mantovani for me is one of the absolute best bass players in the world. If people yes. don't know that. I saw him with uh, Tristan Banks's band uh, back in yeah, uh, and, Chris, yeah. And, and Tristan is like you know so when Davide plays with a great drummer, forget it, <laughs> you mm, know. Yeah, if you're yeah. in the audience, you're gonna have a great time, man. You know. So, so yeah, anyway, so he's, he's coming up in uh, um, April. Yeah, yeah, I saw that in late April, right? Late yeah. April. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Sam, so. I really like Johnny's attitude, but I just thought that maybe, especially as a younger guy, he was not going to have his shit together. And he was right in the pocket and he could solo over the stuff. And when you're a drummer and you can lock with the bass player really quickly, then it's, you know, I, I have this little saying, like when you, when I'm playing with a bass player and they turn around and give you this look and this smile, there is there is nothing the only thing better than that is like when a woman does that you know what I mean like she gives you that look because like you're getting this look from this guy and you and him or girl and you and the bass player are propelling you're like the you're like driving the train you know mm. and the energy of the room it's from you you know and then if you have good players on top so Frances uh, Francesco put me in touch with Marco Marconi and I actually met Marco last year and, and, uh, and uh, Francesco said that Marco is a wizard. And then I listened to his music and he's also another person. This is another thing I like about all three, Johnny, Francesco and Marco are not musical snobs. They sure. play all kinds of music yeah. authentically. Right. So just from that, we really have that in common because because Francesco has tunes that are like kind of Schofield funk and then jazzy, you know, light stuff. And the same with Marco. And, um, and they like my variety. And I don't do variety just to variety. I just do it because that's what I'm hearing. And I'm trying to, yeah. Yeah. to be sincere and truthful to what I'm hearing, you know. So for me, those are three of the best players on the scene there, really.
Yeah, yeah, really looking I, forward to I, meeting them. I'm fortunate to have them. I really am, you know. And I'm humbled that guys like that want to play my music, you know. It's it's yeah, a, it's, it's, it's a uh, great it's feeling. A, yeah, it really is. It really is. Cool. So we've only got a few more minutes left, but um, uh, something I'd love to ask you is uh, if they put you on the spot with uh, what, what do you reckon your three favorite albums would be if you had to pick three? Well, you know, this is hard because I could pick three albums in one genre, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then we think of albums like, you know, if I think of the Bach Sonitas and Partitas for solo violin, this well, is I not like an album, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> but yet that is like something that just goes through me, you know, in a way. And there's no drums or no rhythm, no rhythm instruments. You know, there's rhythm. This is another thing. Rhythm doesn't have to come from rhythm instruments. Rhythm is in everything, you know. Yeah. So but I would have to boy, you know, it is putting me on the spot. Um, maybe one of the maybe like Inner Mountain Flame because it was so different. Oh. It was just so, Meet, so different. Meeting of the Spirits, the opening track is awesome. Yeah. 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 And, you know, my brother says on, on, uh, on Kind of Blue, you can hear the heroin, he says. <laughs> it's the whole band. And it's terrible. And any young people in there, stay away from that shit and don't think you can play better when you're high because you can't. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to party once in a while, that's normal. Everybody does that. But, you, you know, don't be like, half of those guys died man you know but kind of blue would would be up there for sure mm -hmm. yeah i love monk though you know um so it's hard and uh, i would have to have a Jimi hendrix you know i grew up i came from rock first even though my father yeah, sure. was, a, I was my father was a jazz drummer and maybe i was rebelling against that and i didn't get into jazz right away because i thought it was not and then later i got to really appreciate jazz so that's why it's hard for just three, because like I said, I could pick three in three different genres. I could pick three King Crimson albums or whatever. You yeah, know? yeah. I, could, I could pick three Miles albums, or I could pick three Schofield or Michael Brecker. You know, he was just coming through really, really, really growing when he died. Same thing with Tony Williams. The album Wilderness, all that music is written by a drummer and it's orchestral. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So it's a tough question, Dave. Tough question. No, there's some great, great answers in there. So, yeah, well, thanks for taking the time out today uh, to have a chat with us. Really looking forward to uh, meeting you in person on uh, Thursday and uh, listening to what you got to play for us. So uh, wish you a safe trip over and uh, see you on Thursday. I appreciate that. And all you folks listening, stay with the support the community. They're doing great things. That's all I wanted to say. OK, thanks very thanks, much. Rob. Take care now. Cheers. Yeah.